Our next speaker is Dr. Victor Stenger. Dr. Stenger holds a master's and a PhD from the University of California, Los Angeles, both in physics. His research career has helped establish the property of the properties of strange particles, quarks, gluons, and neutrinos, and other words I don't know what they mean. And he has helped pioneer the emerging fields of very high energy gamma ray and neutrino astronomy. As of September 2009, he's published nine books uh, for general audiences on physics, quantum mechanics, cosmology, philosophy, religion, atheism, and pseudoscience. Uh, the latest book is uh, The New Atheism, Taking a Stand for Reason and Science. Uh, this was, um, his book, God, the Failed Hypothesis, was a New York Times bestseller. And I know for those of you who were at the meetup last night, a lot of you asked me um, how you... Uh, defend the universe from nothing hypothesis, and if you want a book that really lays it out for you, God the Failed Hypothesis is the one. I could not recommend it more. Uh, some other noted works of his includes The Comprehensible Cosmos and Quantum Gods, Creation, Chaos, and the Search for Cosmic Consciousness. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Victor Stenger. Well, thanks so much for, uh, to all of you for coming. Uh, the, I whipped together a few slides this morning since I saw everybody was using slides. I, I, I used to use slides a lot in my talk, uh, and, and uh, my wife kind of talked me out of using them because she said they're too distracting. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is just show you a few slides and then uh, mainly just give the talk uh, uh, without, with, with no reference to the slides so I don't get that distraction. And, uh, and then we'll uh, summarize things at the end with a slide. Now, the, uh, uh, this book is about, about the new atheism. And, um, you know, so let me first tell you what the new atheism is, how I would define the new atheism. You know, atheists would have no objection if religious activities were confined to home, church, mosque. But when believers come outside of their churches to seek and seek to impose their beliefs on the rest of us, then we have a right to object. When they want those beliefs taught in public schools, even though they contradict well-established science uh, or other uh, uh, academic disciplines, then we have a, a right to object. When the application of these beliefs to public policy result in the suffering and deaths of millions of people, as they have, we have a right to object. Religious ideas uh, seem to get a, a uh, free ride. They're not questioned as much as, as uh, ideas in other fields of, of thought. And we really insist that they should be that we should question any religious idea, just like we would question any scientific idea. They should be subject to the same kind of critical analysis. Now, uh, yesterday we heard uh, the speakers in the debate claim that, that uh, faith, their faith is based on evidence. Well, I'm going to define faith as belief in the absence of evidence. So if they have evidence, which I would love to see, uh, then that's not a belief anymore, uh, not, not faith anymore, but it's a belief. It's a belief like a scientific belief. I mean, uh, religious faith is belief in the absence of evidence. Scientific belief is not a faith. It's belief in the presence of evidence. So once you have the evidence, uh, then it's no longer a matter of faith. And so, the, um, the new atheism, again, is, is a movement that uh, was started with Sam Harris's book, uh, The End of Faith, suggesting that, uh, that we should, st we should uh, f work to eliminate faith because faith is, is uh, quite injurious to, to uh, both individuals and to society. So let me show you... The, the just to show you the four books that uh, oops, down this, one. this was what's, what uh, is usually defined as 
as the new atheism, at least in the in the uh, literature and in the, in the newspapers and journals. Uh, there were in the period 2004 to 2007, there were these six books that came out by uh, uh, five different authors, and usually you just hear the Four Horsemen. Uh, but I put myself in there as kind of the stable boy <laughs> because my book down there that you see in the middle and bottom was God the Failed Hypothesis was also a New York Times bestseller as were as these. In fact, I sold as many books as Daniel Dennett, so it should have been, you know, you really should have been <laughs> listed. <laughs> anyway, this, this uh, it's the writings of these books that basically define the that I've defined the new atheism from, and it's not to say that there aren't there aren't other new atheists or people that might be you know, should be labeled new atheists. So let me just man show you some of the others. Uh, we have Dan Barker, who's going to be around some at some point. Uh, Dan Barker and John Loftus uh, uh, are both people who've. Uh, who've come to atheism from being evangelical preachers and their books uh, are wonderful books. When you buy Godless, make sure that you get the one by and, uh, Dan Barker, not the one by, with, under the same title, by Ann Coulter. <laughs> so, and uh, John Loft is why he, how he became an atheist. Now, when I, when I wrote this book, I got chastised by bloggers for not giving sufficient attention to uh, to the blogger community, and I have to admit that the the blog, the whole blogger community, uh, really deserves a lot of credit for bringing atheism uh, uh, to young people, especially. Uh, and so, I'm trying to amend that. I'll add to, to add PZ there. Whether or not these people, incidentally, would prefer to be called new atheists is up to them. I, I'm, I'm, I'm saying I look at their, what they write and they, they fit into what I would call the new atheists. And of course we have Bill Maher. He actually calls himself an agnostic. So, but, uh, and then I, I, I listed uh, the speakers here. I think every, every one of these speakers uh, uh, is a new atheist best, uh, based on what I've, I've, heard them, I've heard them say. And I, for, for the next generation, I've put... JT, where's the TJ, which is it? No, it's JT. <laughs> You'll have to have him tell, tell you what he calls himself JT at some other time. Now, the, um, one of the marks of the New Atheism is that uh, we disagree with many of the positions with respect to religion that have been taken by some prominent scientists, uh, including many who were atheists, and scientific organizations such as the National Academy of Sciences, the uh, National uh, uh, Center for Science Education, uh, we disagree with many of the statements that they they make. Uh, it's interesting in the case of the National Academy of Sciences. The National Academy of Sciences uh, was polled back in 1998, and it was shown that it was only seven percent. Uh, of the membership uh, believed in a personal God, exactly opposite to the rest of the population. Uh, uh, these, are, these are scientists, uh, the elite of American science, and yet they've made a number of statements to the effect that science has nothing to say about God or the supernatural. Now that's complete nonsense, because if you look at, you try to, I mean, try to think of any other institution in, in the U.S., uh, uh, bakers or accountants or whatever, and see uh, uh, if any of them are only seven percent belief in a in a, uh, a personal God. I mean, why is it that the National Academy of Sciences has only seven percent belief? It's obviously because they're scientists, and so if, if they're scientists, the science must say something about God. Their own science says something about God, but also. Uh, it's clear that uh, there are people who are doing science that bear on the question of the supernatural. For example, the prayer studies that have been done by reputable institutions such as Harvard, uh, Duke, 
and Mayo Clinic. And these experiments uh, could have turned out evidence for God. They were conducted very well, and, and, and they weren't done by skeptics. Uh, most of the scientists and, and, and the teams that did these experiments were believers of one kind or another, and yet they, they uh, uh, came up with negative results that they were perfectly willing to publish. Uh, and the point is, though, that uh, right under the nose of the National Academy of Sciences, you have people uh, doing experiments that bear on the supernatural, because it could have happened that the, the experiments on prayer turned out positive. And, they, and uh, you know, an example I'd like to give, suppose that it turned out that only Catholic prayers worked, and Protestant prayers didn't, and Muslim prayers, and Hindu prayers. Nobody else's prayers worked but Catholics. And you'd have to conclude that, well, maybe... Well, first of all, the point is, you wouldn't be able to come up with any natural explanation for that. I mean, uh, if uh, you'd have to say, well, maybe there's something to Catholicism. After all, maybe they do have the truth. I was raised as a Catholic. I was baptized. So all I would have to do is go down to the nearest uh, Catholic church, uh, go into the confessional, uh, and uh, say, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It's been 50 years since my last confession. And, uh, I would be back in the fold. I mean, it's just... Uh, it could have happened, that, and that's the point. People, when people like the, our opponents in the de uh, debate yesterday say that science can not prove or disprove God, that's nonsense. Like, there are many ways in that God could reveal himself to us. Uh, 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 another example is, is uh, uh, revelation. That's just what revealing is. You, you could reveal truths. These are things that could be tested. I talked about this a little bit yesterday, so I will expand on it, but it, it's a testable, revelation is testable. All you have to do is, is uh, find some revelation that turns out to be true, and the person could not have known that truth. Then you'd have, again, a hard time explaining that naturally. Uh, we also disagree uh, with the position of the uh, late and great paleontologist Stephen Jay Gould, who in one of his last, if not his last book, uh, Rocks of Ages, tried to argue that uh, science and religion are two non-overlapping magisteria. Now, this was a good intention attempt by Gould to try to eliminate the, the battles between science and religion. The trouble was it didn't describe the way science and religion are. Both of them step on each other's turf uh, religion, he tried to basically redefine religion as, as uh, uh, moral philosophy. Well, it's not just moral philosophy. You know, religion tries to tell you a lot of things about, about the world. And, uh, and then, of course, science has no prescription. There's no reason why science can't consider morality, because morality involves human behavior, and human behavior is observable. And that's what science does. Science makes observations. So uh, the fact is that the, the God of Abraham, the God that most people worship, is, is detectable. You know, I didn't finish my transparent, my slides here, just a sec, see what's that. Yeah, let me just go through a few other books uh, before I continue. Uh, historian Bart Ehrman uh, is, was, again, someone who went from being an evangelical preacher to a biblical scholar, and he's written a number of books, also bestsellers. Uh, the one in particular that I think is his most important book is God's Problem over there on the right, where he, uh, he tells how the problem of suffering was what eventually uh, caused him not to believe any longer. And uh, he goes through the Old and New Testament uh, and tries to, he talks about how, how the, uh, it tries, tries to cope with the problem of suffering and basically cannot solve the problem of, of, uh, of suffering. And I should also, I have to point it this way, just list some new, some of the anti-New Atheist books that came out, uh, mostly uh, attacking Richard Dawkins. See Richard Dawkins over here on the right. 
uh, although uh, some attacked Sam Harris, and um, God then uh, God and eighth, the New Atheism up here on the right by John F. Hott. Uh, Hott is a pretty well-known theologian, and I discuss a lot of his criticisms in the book. I mention these others as well, uh, and, and others uh, in the book. And uh, finally, let me, uh, for now, on the slides, let me just show one more. See how distracting they are? You can't go on with my talk because I gotta show the slides. <laughs> and I just would ask you to imagine a world without religion. Uh, if you don't recognize this picture, it's a New York skyline prior to uh, September 11, 2001. So as I started to say that uh, science uh, uh, is certainly capable of studying the supernatural, and in my book, God, The Failed Hypothesis, what's unique about that book, I think it's the first time that anybody has gone beyond just the argument that there's no evidence for God. Certainly there's no evidence for God. If there was evidence for God, and despite what uh, the theists might say, if there was evidence for God, we're talking about scientific evidence now, it would be in the textbooks. You would find it in the textbooks along with the evidence for neutrinos and electrons and everything else. But it's not, and, and every, any theist has to accept that fact. The kind of evidence they talk about, it's obviously not scientific evidence. I've had it said to me many times, well, there is evidence. Uh, for God, and then when you ask, oh yeah, what? Well, I'm willing to listen, you know, and you give me the evidence, as I explained already, you should give me the evidence, uh, uh, then I, if it's strong enough, I'll believe, and usually they come back with something like, well, there was the empty tomb, you see, and, uh, well, that's, you know, if, if I, if I went into the Napoleon uh, uh, burial, uh, there's a, in Paris, there's a place where N N Napoleon's, uh, you can visit, uh, view N Napoleon's casket. Um, and uh, if I ever walked, walked in there someday and it wasn't there, I wouldn't think that it rose up to heaven. I would just say, well, they, they, they took it, somebody took it away for, uh, for maintenance or something. I mean, it was, <laughs> you, you, know, you, always, you look for the simplest explanations of things, you see. And that's, that's, and, and you have to rule out any simple explanation before you can accept any complex explanation. Now, I argued in God the Failed Hypothesis that the, the, the God that most people worship is not only, uh, uh, is not only no evidence for that God, but there's evidence against that God. And that took a little bit more explanation. I'm actually taking a positive stance here. I'm saying there's no evidence, that the evidence that we have out there can be interpreted as, as evidence against the existence of God. Now, I have to explain again that I don't mean every conceivable God. You could conceive of a God that was undetectable, that was just to set the universe in motion and didn't do anything for it, a deist God, for example. And that God would be difficult to find evidence for, but, uh, or against. But the God that most people worship, the Judeo-Christian Islamic God, is a God that participates uh, in the universe in, in a very detailed way, and listens to every human thought, causes every particle to move from one point to another. Uh, uh, this is at least what uh, the omnipotent uh, uh, God is supposed to be able to do. And uh, you often hear the statement that, and mostly from theists, although Carl Sagan is, has, has uh, given some credit for it, I don't think he was the first one to say it, and that is that absence of evidence is not evidence for absence. And I dispute that. I say absence of evidence can be evidence for absence in, in many circumstances. Uh, let me give you some examples. Uh, if, if someone claimed there were uh, elephants in Rocky Mountain National Park, which is near where I live, uh, then, and people looked and didn't find any evidence, they didn't find any, see any elephants, they didn't see any huge droppings and, and uh, smashed grass or whatever that you would expect if you had elephants there, you could include beyond a reasonable doubt. Maybe they are, maybe they are there. You could conclude beyond a reasonable doubt that uh, the elephants uh, don't exist. And that's the kind of proof I'm talking about, not, not uh, uh, proof with, with infinite certainty, but proof with uh, 
uh, very high probability. We've, again, these, these things we've discussed a bit uh, yesterday. Another example I would like to give that bears more uh, on the question of, of God is the fact that there is now ample evidence that the Exodus did not happen. And the Exodus, of course, is one of the most important events in, in, uh, in all three monotheistic religions. It's where God supposedly gave this covenant to, um, to Moses in the Ten Commandments and so on, and yet you can rule it out. You can rule it out scientifically uh, that it didn't happen because there's, there are no campsites in the Sinai. The Sinai has been searched archaeologically up and down more than probably any other place on earth. Uh, and uh, while they find campsites from thousands of years earlier, small groups of, of, of uh, primitive peoples wandering around, they find their campsites, but they don't find any campsites of the Israelites during the period of time to be traced to that time. Just uh, any biblical archeologist today will tell you that uh, our archeologist is not bound up uh, to some religion by faith that uh, this is now uh, a foregone conclusion that that uh, the whole Exodus story was a myth. So you see, you can find evidence against God or against the supernatural or against some of the uh, teachings. And there are many other examples. Christmas, for example, is in, in many uh, uh, cases, case can be drawn that certain things should have happened, to have been observed. The things described in the Christmas story should have been observed uh, and, and re reported in history like the slaughter of the innocents and so on, that should have been reported by Roman historians. There were lots of historians in those days and there were historians living in, in Jerusalem who wrote about a lot of things and never wrote about uh, any of these events, never wrote about Jesus. Uh, a very good case is, is beginning to build that Jesus uh, didn't exist. Certainly the Jesus of the Bible uh, is a myth, but uh, no doubt about that. But there may have been a figure that it was based on, but uh, it's even being uh, questioned uh, now. Not necessary for our argument to say there wasn't a G uh, somebody named, uh, that it was based on, but again, the uh, stories are mythological. Now, as I said, there are many ways that uh, God could have been discovered by prayer, by revelation, uh, and it hasn't been. Uh, there are other examples that go to cosmology, biology. Uh, the world doesn't look, the universe doesn't look designed. As G.J. said, it really looks undesigned. And, uh, and again, you have to look at the data. So to a person who's not very scientific, it may look designed, but when you look at the data, as a scientist looks at the data, you see uh, that the universe looks just like it should look if it wasn't designed. Now I'm gonna use the the remainder of my time uh, to talk about some of the cosmological issues because that's the area where I'm about the only one uh, uh, with the background in physics and cosmology uh, to speak about it. About the only one I could mention who, who, who talks about atheism and, and physics and cosmology is my good friend and colleague uh, Tanner Edis, who's actually at Truman State University. And I'm sorry not to. Not to see him here, maybe he'll come next year. Uh, but uh, the two of us are pre pretty much the only people who write books on, on atheism and, and, uh, and the God issue uh, from a physicist standpoint. So I'm going to uh, talk about some of the issues that come up with cosmology. Now, for 30 years now, a uh, uh, sleazy, uh, <laughs> I should, I'm letting my personality. Opinions get out. A uh, very well known and, and respected uh, uh, Christian apologist named William Lane Craig uh, has been arguing uh, for the existence of God. Now, not necessarily, his, his argument doesn't necessarily point to the Christian God, uh, it points to some kind of power, some kind of creator in the universe. And the argument he's been using uh, is called the cosmological argument or the Kalam cosmological argument. It goes something like this, that the universe had a beginning, proof, the Big Bang, uh, that the universe, uh, uh, anything that begins must have an end, and, uh, uh, I'm sorry, 
must have a, uh, I said that right, anything that begins has, has a cause. And anything, and so therefore that cause must be a, an external creator, something external to the universe. If the universe had a cause, it had to be something external. So that's the Kalam cosmological argument. Well, it's, it doesn't hold up on a number of fronts. Uh, for example, it's not true that everything that begins has a cause. We have many examples from quantum mechanics of events that take place uh, spontaneously without cause. So that's not true. Also, the fact that the universe uh, began with the Big Bang is, is, not, is, is, is uh, debatable. Uh, because although our universe, as we know it, uh, the, certainly began with the Big Bang, there's strong, uh, strong evidence for that, uh, appearing from some, some tiny area uh, of, of very uh, Planck dimensions where everything is in chaos. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that that universe uh, began at that point, but he, uh, Craig bases his argument on, on a theorem that was derived by Roger Penrose and, and Stephen Hawking back in 1970. And that is that the universe began in a singularity. Uh, it, that is a, a point in space and time of infinitesimal size and of infinite density. And that's true that the, they did derive such a theorem, but the theorem was based on general relativity the uh, Einstein theory of general relativity that came out in 1916. And that's not a quantum theory. Uh, and when you take quantum mechanics into account, you, you find that uh, this singularity did not exist. Now, uh, Hawking said so. He said so 20 years ago in his book, uh, his bestseller, A Brief History of Time. He kind of laughs about it. He said, I, 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 I try to convince everybody the universe started as a singularity. And now I'm trying to convince everybody that it didn't. And Penrose also uh, agrees with that. Yet, the, yet you go even to the latest Christian literature, you'll see that argument be, made. Dinesh D'Souza has two books out recently where he makes that same argument. Uh, what's uh, wrong with Christianity? And also a new book that he just wrote uh, uh, called, uh, that's about life after death. And in both cases, he uses this example. And uh, Craig still uses this example in his talks. Uh, I, I, I debated him in 2003, pointed out uh, where that was wrong. Two months later, he was giving a talk at the University of Colorado, which I attended, and he was using that argument again. It's still on his website. So uh, he must know it's wrong by now, but he still insists on using it. And uh, what's interesting about uh, D'Souza's book is D'Souza lifts uh, Stephen Hawking's uh, quotation, uh, lifts a quotation from Stephen Hawking's book out of context so that he completely turns it around. I talk about that in my book, The New Atheism, but uh, uh, he takes a, a quotation. He says it's on page 50 of Hawking's book. It's actually on page 52, but that's not important. It'll help you find it. Uh, he just lifts it out of context and turns it around. What he, he, he has Hawking say that the universe began in the singularity and what Hawking actually says is the universe, we proved that the universe began in a singularity subject to this general relativity, but now when we consider quantum mechanics, we know that it didn't occur in a singularity. So he just, he just turned it around uh, completely. Another sleazy guy, Dinesh D'Souza. <laughs> so, so that whole argument uh, just falls flat. The universe did not have to be, the, the reason they say the universe began is that if, if you had this singularity, then time and everything must have started at that point because you couldn't have any, anything before that. Uh, and uh, the, the fact is that there are any number of models, in fact, Hawking and another collaborator, James Hartle, came up with a model about 20 years ago uh, that I like uh, that describes the a natural origin of the universe. Uh, I have taken it. I've taken it a little in a different direction than they talk about. Uh, and I, but I've worked it out completely mathematically, using the mathematics at a, a level of, of just undergraduate physics uh, major. And um, it's in my book, uh, The Comprehensible Cosmos. 
And what it is is a, a scenario for a natural origin of the universe uh, as, as by means of quantum tunneling from an, an earlier universe. Like everything that we know from cosmology now leads us to say not, not that the universe had a beginning at all, but that the universe always existed in, in the past and, will always, uh, and future. And in fact, past and future are, are symmetrical. There's no difference between past and future uh, at the fundamental level. There's nothing in, in physics that selects out an, a particular arrow of time uh, at, the, uh, at the fundamental level, at the microscopic scale. So the whole question of how could a universe have come from nothing is, is really moot because uh, in this model, it doesn't come from nothing. It always existed. Uh, and so you don't have to really explain how it came from nothing. I know this issue of, of how can something come from nothing uh, has, is constantly discussed. In fact, when, a, uh, when you back a theist into the corner, you, could, you knock down every one of his arguments, and they are all, I've heard them all, and I didn't hear no one yesterday, and I haven't heard a dozen times before. Uh, when you knock them all down, they still come back and say, well, uh, the, uh, how do you explain how uh, the universe came from nothing? Well, a better way to put that question, and this is the way it's often put, is why is there something rather than nothing? And that, I've had a number of people uh, uh, ask me about that, uh, so I would like to try to explain that a little better, I'm, uh, and, uh, and we'll end at that point and have time for, for questions. Now, um, First of all, it's very difficult to define the word nothing. What is, to define what is nothing, because if you, once you define it by some property, it has a property, therefore it must be something. So something without properties. You, you, uh, so now I'm a, a, a physicist and I think operationally, and I say, how would we achieve the state of nothing? Well, I would just keep, uh, uh, start out with the universe and its particles and keep removing particles until I had no particles left. Now, interestingly enough, within the theory of quantum, quantum field theory, uh, you can do this. You can do this mathematically. What you do is you, you start out with some photons, let's say, and, and uh, you keep removing them. There is a, there is a mathematical operator called the destruct, uh, annihilation operator, which enables you to keep removing photons. And what happens is you, and this is true of other particles as well, you keep removing them, you keep removing them, and you finally get zero particles. So I would say, well, there's zero particles. Uh, that's, uh, you know, that's as nothing as nothing can be, I suppose. But the interesting thing about it is that there's still energy. There's zero point energy. Uh, uh, and you'd have to get rid of that. But anyway, let's, let's uh, just point out that that in this state of, uh, you can still write the wave function down for it. You can still describe, in other words, a vacuum state uh, uh, physically. So if you could describe it mathematically, uh, then that's, that's fine. It still has some, has some meaning, there, uh, you know, some uh, accuracy to it. In any case, uh, why is there? Uh, something rather than nothing. The uh, uh, philosopher, a very well-known philosopher of science, Adolf Grunbaum, has analyzed this problem in, in, in great philosophical detail uh, in, in a very difficult to read article. All of his articles are very difficult to read, but he's, he's regarded as one of the uh, top uh, uh, philosophers of science in the world. Kind of interesting guy. I know him fairly well. And you know, you know he's pretty old because he's Jewish and his name is Adolf. <laughs> now, how many Jews have been named Adolf since, since World War II? <laughs> and he's a very nice guy, a wonderful guy. Uh, so, but his, his argument, if I, I understand it, is that is basically that there's a, again a category mistake being made when you when you ask that question it's a meaningless question because you're you're assuming that nothing is, is somehow more natural than something that if left alone you'd have nothing 
and then something, you'd have to then explain why something came, when in fact uh, uh, it could have been the other way around. Well, what I add to that is a, is a physicist uh, uh, fact that, that in fact in, in uh, nature, and it also is true in biology as well as, as, as uh, physics with evolution, there's a tendency, and people find this hard to believe, especially theists, there's a tendency for uh, complexity to arise out of simplicity, for, uh, for s simple systems to spontaneously change into more complex systems. Now, example of that is water. Water will f freeze into ice if you leave it alone. If there's no heat uh, causing the ice to melt. Or the, uh, so you can take away the heat, and the natural tendency is phase transition from liquid to, to, to uh, ice, which is much more structured. A crystal of ice is highly structured compared to uh, just a liquid drop of water. So in nature, there is this tendency to go from simplicity to complexity, and uh, the thing, the way you can uh, apply that to this nothing business is that uh, nothing is, a, uh, uh, is about as simple as you can get, it's as symmetrical as you can get, would be something that has no structure at all. If it's, we define it as a, a system with no structure, no properties that we could find, that's nothing. That's going to be simpler than the, the, the system with the, the complex system. So it's a natural transition would be from nothing to something. And if you were to then try to say, uh, why is there something rather than nothing, that's natural. Because then, as uh, I think uh, JT quoted uh, Frank Wilczek, because he read my book, where I, he got that quotation. Uh, is saying Frank Wilczek is a Nobel Prize winner who's, who's asked that question, why is there nothing rather than something? He says, because nothing is, nothing is unstable. And in fact, it's kind of interesting. If the universe was nothing, if you had nothing in the universe, you'd have to have God to maintain that nothing. <laughs> so not only, so, the, so uh, uh, you'd have to ask, why is, there, why is there nothing rather than something? Because, uh, uh, and then you, uh, if the universe was nothing, we could conclude that God existed because there's only one way that the universe could maintain a state of nothing, and that is by having a God to do to maintain that. Of course, we wouldn't be around to say it, so it wouldn't do any good. So, uh, you know, so, so I'll I'll end, end the story there, and uh, with just one more slide, I think. What should we? Help us. <laughs> Science flies you to the moon. Religion flies you into buildings. I proposed this. To, Richard Dawkins was collecting slug, slogans to put on buses. This actually never appeared on a bus. That's a, that's a computer simulation of a bus. Uh, but uh, uh, he was collecting slogans, and so I sent this one in. And he said it was the best one that, that he got. So. <laughs> okay, thanks so much, and I hope there's time for questions.